Good afternoon to those of you in the mountain, central, and eastern time zones, and good morning to those of you calling in from the Pacific time zone. Welcome to the second of two very interesting and timely webinars on the topic of telebehavioral health. These webinars are brought to you by the SAMHSA Behavioral Health Information Technologies and Standards Initiative. My name is Alan Mosley, an and associate scientist with Apt Associates, part of the BHIDS team. Last week's webinar examined telebehavioral health from the consumer standpoint. Today's session will examine this technology from the provider's perspective. Now, as usual, a PDF of this PowerPoint presentation will be emailed to all registered participants for this webinar. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted to SAMHSA's <coughs> YouTube page located at www.samhsa.gov. Please note that all lines are muted um, and you can submit comments via the chat box feature typically found in the lower right portion of your screen. We'll save all questions that come in for the final 15 minutes of our hour together. And so with that, let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Marlene Mayhew serves as the Executive Director of the Telebehavioral Health Institute, Incorporated, located online at telehealth.org, where she oversees the development and delivery of professional training in behavioral health via an e-learning platform that has served consumers and clinicians from over 70 countries. The focus for Dr. Mayhew has been legal and ethical risk management related to the use of technologies to better serve behavioral health patients. She has served as a consultant, researcher, author, trainer, and keynoter. And with that, Dr. Mayhew, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Mogul. I'm delighted to be here today, and I'd like you to um, understand my role is one of being an educator, I am a licensed psychologist and a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm not an attorney, I am not an IT specialist, and I'm not a physician, so I'm here just to educate and to help point you to some of the materials that we have available to us today and to help you uh, hopefully get, get um, interested in this area so that you can pursue more training. We have 45 minutes for me to give you a very quick overview, and I've had to select just some topics but there are many involved, and I'll give you sort of um, an, an uh, aerial view of what the topics might be as we go as well. Now, the main question I get from clinicians is, is telebehavioral health really safe? Um, what, what's the efficacy? But does it really work? So safety and efficacy, two big issues. The first thing that I encourage people to think about is that behavioral health is the largest unmet health care need in the United States. So the need is huge. And we have a database that we've accumulated at our institute, the Telebehavioral Health Institute, of 4,200 articles that talk about the safety and the effectiveness of telebehavioral health. So these are peer-reviewed articles and books that can give us a lot of information in a lot of different areas. The problem is that when people go look at some of this data, they are looking in their own discipline. So they might be looking in psychology or looking in counseling or nursing, and they may not find the breadth of, it, of what's out there. So I'm giving you some of the common terms. And frankly, we have a colleague who has documented that the, the licensing boards alone for behavioral health care use no less than 25 different terms. So if you in your state are calling it telemental health, Another state might be calling it telebehavioral health. Another one in the counseling world is distance counseling. So in, in, the, in the literature that I started, I started publishing this field in 1997. That was my first textbook. We talked about behavioral telehealth. So you see, you might think you're looking up what you need to be doing, but you're using the long term. So overall, the concept that we use at the Institute is telebehavioral health because SAMHSA, decided several years back that they were going to try to depathologize the terms substance abuse and mental health and combine them into a term called behavioral health. If you go to the SAMHSA website, which I really encourage you to do, 
you'll see that they use behavioral health everywhere. You might find an older slide set that talks about mental health, but all in all, these terms are getting replaced by tele, by, by behavioral health, and then by default, everything you find on the CMSO website will be talking about all the links and all the things that are current. We talk about telebehavioral health. So there's been an evolution of the terms, and hopefully, a coming together of different opinions about which term to use to follow what we decided to do at the Institute, which is follow the lead of the government. Figure if the government can't figure out what to call this, we're really lost. <laughs> so in any case, when you go around, you'll see that your board might call this digital therapy, or I just spoke in Ohio, and I believe they called it um, electronic health care delivery. So be aware that there is a body of literature out there, and uh, it's very well documented. And I'll give you some resources to how to find that later. Now, so I'm going to also give you some of the key terms and concepts, and a very fundamental one is the issue of distant site versus originating site. In the literature, when you go look things up, you'll see distant site is us, okay? It's the clinicians. And in our minds, that's not intuitive. We think we're the center of the world, but we're not. Actually, we're in, a, in an era of patient-centered healthcare, and so the originating site is where the patient is. The, the service originates from that patient on to clinicians, and the, the care originates from the patient forward. So. Originating site refers to the patient site. And you'll see a bunch of derivations of this as well. But for the most part, people understand now distant is us, originating is the patient or the client. Now, I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about the classic model versus what we see online through the internet because they're two very different worlds. And when I started writing in 1997, the, uh, the only model out there was what we call now classic model, a traditional model. And it was very much steeped in the medical world. Actually, my first textbook, or was it my second textbook, was an attempt to bring telepsychiatry to the allied health fields. That was published in 2004. And so uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of change since 2004, but nonetheless, I think it really helps people understand this classic model. First is the idea of hub and spoke. There would be an urban center, a city, okay, and it would connect out to practitioners in rural areas. And so the hub was the urban center and the spokes were these urban, these rural areas. And they would start doing that through phone lines and then transmitting video, very slow moving video through the phone lines. And they could do that for behavioral health care because we don't move a lot. This is not dance therapy. For the most part, we're talking and most of us are sta staying stationary. The other thing that they would do is they would work with previously identified clients. So the person in the remote site would say, you know, I can handle most of the traffic coming through our doors, but, you know, there's a few percent here of folks that I really don't know how to differentiate this, this diagnosis or that one. I need an outside consult. So this consultative model started up where they would send information about the person that they had met in person, in the flesh, okay, and they sent information up to a consultant in one of these hub urban centers and say, what do you think? Can you help me with, with this diagnosis and treatment plan? And so that is, is how it evolved. And that is a classic model that still is alive today in a lot of telehealth systems that are funded by the federal government, by state governments. So there's oftentimes an in-person assessment. And when you look at literature, then these are important distinctions because jumping online with an online employer is very different than what I'm talking about. And every step you take away from this classic model, you are increasing your risk, not just the patient, the risk for the patient, but your professional risk. What I'm trying to do here today is give you a quick overview of how to manage your own risk, okay, and deliver good quality care at the same time. So they would get detailed and documented referral requests. They would have the entire health record at their fingertips so that they could look up when they're doing this consult. And oftentimes there was a community collaborator, not only was the referring party in that local community, but they might have also engaged somebody else in the community to sort of be boots on the ground and help the clinicians by knocking on the door, by making doing a wellness check, uh, by going and just prodding the person, getting them on board, giving another opinion of what's going on. So when you're not in a community and you can't see what's happening, it could be very helpful to get that kind of collaborator. So the client and the patient as well was pre-trained pre by the local staff. So they knew what to do if there was a power outage or, you know, there was a backup system. 
the technology is very stable because it was an IT staff, a technology staff, available during the entire time. So a lot of this we documented in my 2004 book, but you know these classic models. I'm going to rapidly move forward to uh, 2012 when Godletsky, Dr. Godletsky, a psychiatrist and colleagues reported about a study that they had conducted at the VA. Now, if you look at the reference on this, you'll see that in the title, outcomes of 98,609 U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs patients, that's the sample size, 98,609 patients were in the study. That's a pretty remarkable study. And what they found was that using telehealth over a four-year period decreased hospital utilization by 25 percent. It's these numbers that started making healthcare reform to uh, including telehealth really started making this come alive because obviously it saves money, it saves time, and it, it helps people in ways that couldn't be helped before. So uh, the thing about uh, Dr. Gadletsi's study is that she very clearly in the last paragraph of that whole article talks about service to the home was the next frontier. So if you think about service to the home being the next frontier, that was at that point unresearched, relatively unresearched in 2012. Then you have to start wondering about a lot of the things that you see clinicians doing online in terms of the safety of what's happening. And where's, where are these ideas coming from if they're not following an evidence-based classic model? Now there's hope, so don't, so don't give up hope, but I just want to show you how, what the evolution is. In 2013, Hilti, Dr. Hilti and his colleagues did a, the first meta-analysis that, that I was aware of. Remarkable study. They looked at 70, 755, and they threw out 80, all but 85 of the studies. And what they came up with was that across many populations in many, many settings, outcomes were comparable to in-person care. They also looked at new models of care, collaborative care, asynchronous care, which means not in real time. So text messaging is asynchronous. It doesn't happen in real time. It can, but you can also wait and then respond the next day. Mobile health, so there are positive outcomes. The only caveat is that these are very highly controlled studies where you've got, once again, in this hub and spoke model, an urban center, typically affiliated with the university, conducting a study and they get participants from physician's offices, psychotherapy offices, drug and alcohol treatment facilities, and they select the mild to moderately depressed or anxious group of people. They give them manualized care, let's say a 12-session model, and then they, they look at the results after all the clinicians in this 12-session 12, 12 model have been coached in how to deliver this exact protocol. It's not somebody sitting around and just talking as it would in, in an open psychotherapy session. This is highly protocol driven. And then we get these really high outcome studies. So when people talk about evidence base, I want to encourage you to think about three things. One is the scientific literature. What are you reading about the science that's out there that makes you believe that it's effective? Does what you're reading make sense compared to these classic models? And then of course, evidence-based means it has three components. So you're looking at some literature. Number two, you're passing it through the filter of your eyes, your brain, your interaction with this patient or this client and what they need. And thirdly, you look at their input on that. So evidence-based is not just, a, oh, I looked at, at a couple of research articles. No, it's this entire process, this entire three-step process that we're responsible to do. So you can't automatically generalize from what these these classic studies have been to, oh yeah, I can just jump on the internet and hey, I'm good, we can do text messaging only, I don't have to talk to the person, I don't have to do any of those things. That is completely wrong. So you cannot generalize from those control studies to what a lot of people are doing on the internet. So I'm going to give you a few steps that you can do to help yourself out here. Number one, conduct your own literature review. Identify five to ten articles of direct relevance to A, your setting, and B, your population. But a lot of people fail to recognize that the setting is crucial here. This is about telehealth. Right? It's about tele. It's about going across distance. But what about that setting? Can you control that setting that that patient or that client is in? If you can't, then you can't, you're not controlling your own session. You have to be in control of your setting, meaning 
your family members aren't coming in, your office mates aren't banging on the door, you're saying hello because they don't realize you're in there working, and you have to be able to control the patient of the, the client's site as well. And if they show up in the back seat of a cab, then you need to know what to do to stop that session and make sure that they get to a secure environment. Now, from the literature that I'm encouraging you to find, get your own list of to-dos and then build those into your protocols because you want to be able to demonstrate that you're following a protocol and you're not just chit-chatting. Now, if you stop and think, well, how big is this literature base? As I mentioned earlier, we at the Institute have more than 4,200 references and there's a free list of those available for you to search online and I give you the URL here at our website, which is telehealth.org. So the place to go search for these is telehealth.org slash bibliography. Now, another complicating factor is that unlike um, ophthalmology or dermatology, we have at least nine disciplines within the behavioral world. And it's been dismaying to me during my lifetime to see the turf wars that are going on between these groups. It's as if we preach getting along, we teach, we, we teach and we preach how to get along with, the, say, family systems or, or uh, social skills, and yet we have a lot of difficulty sitting at the same table. So a large part of my focus as a professional in the telebehavioral world is to try to bring these groups together. I'm going to give you a little smattering of what this looks like. We have nine disciplines, addictions, professionals, behavior analysts, behavior nurse practitioners, counselors, marriage and family therapists, psychologists, psychiatric nurses, psychiatrists, social workers, each of which has its own literature. So something may have been published in the psychology literature, but doesn't show up in the counseling literature or the social work literature or the psychiatric nurse literature. So you see, when you look online, it's better to go to places like Google Scholar where they will look for articles for you and what the person's discipline is irrelevant. Or go to a librarian and ask them to conduct these research, research uh, projects for you, which more than, more than, they're typically more than happy to do. Now, what we did, uh, and I've done a lot of research through my time. I um, did a study that was published in the year 2000 looking at the, the psychology world and their understanding of legal ethical obligations. And frankly, it was abysmal. About two-thirds of the people who responded had no clue that there were any legal or ethical issues that were involved in practicing on the internet. They thought they could just do whatever they felt like. So we redid this study. 15 years later, I did this same, so an update on this study with some colleagues, and we just published it a few months ago. So this was like two months ago. And I'm just going to quote for you what, what we found. Although most psychologists, 80%, considered it ethical for licensed mental health professionals to deliver telebehavioral health, only 58% were aware of state and federal laws or regulations governing such activities. Not even two-thirds knew that there were state and federal laws involved. That means a third, more than a third, thought they could still do whatever they pleased. And there's nothing that's further than the truth. Now, what might happen is that in their state, they may have a law and they don't know what it is, okay? They haven't bothered to think about it or look at it. They may be calling it something different in their state. Or their state may be mute on the, on the topic, but it doesn't mean they don't have to adhere and extrapolate out to all the existing rules. So, give an example. Privacy. And we'll get through some more of these in a minute, but you have to maintain the privacy. That is, to protect the privacy of the people you treat. Well, that obligation is called confidentiality. You have to maintain confidentiality. So privacy belongs to the patient, and your job is to, to protect that privacy, and that's called confidentiality, maintaining confidentiality. Now, it doesn't say you have to do that when you talk. It doesn't say you can you only do that uh, when you see it in front of somebody, it just says, you have to do this, okay? Now, how you choose to deliver that care is up to you. There is no state law that says you cannot do telehealth in this country. It may not mention telehealth, but you still, you can choose to practice any way you choose. It's just you better be adhering to a lot of these things like privacy, documentation, uh, you know, just some of these we'll get through. So it's your job whether you know it or not, all right? Ignorance is not a defense in the face of the law. We're talking about understanding the law here. So 
Now I'm going to move into some of the ethical issues and we'll roll back around to the law. So ethics builds on the law, right? So the first precept of any ethical code is that you follow all the applicable laws. A lot of people don't understand the law, which we just established, right? So that you really can't be practicing ethically because they don't even know that any law applies. Now, I've gone through a number of the disciplines and I've pulled out for you the code of ethics. You'll see a picture of the screenshot on the right side here of what that page looks like on the internet, and I typed it out for you if you want to go look. If you happen to be a, uh, an addiction specialist, an addiction professional, then you know you, you know where to go to get this stuff. So NADAC has a code of ethics that is relevant. It actually has a section about this. The American Counseling Association has a section, section H, that's relevant to practicing with technology. The American Psychological Association has an ethical code, but it also came up with a guideline in 2013. This entire thing is about working with technology, but mostly video conferencing. Um, marriage, uh, the Association of Marriage and Family Therapy has a code of ethics in 2015 that also has a section that talks about using technology. The American Telemedicine Association has three guidelines, actually, two from 2009, and this one that I was on the team to help develop looking specifically at video-based online mental health services. So there's a lot in this particular one that I think could be of relevance to you. Now we go into nursing. There's, this is actually their sixth edition of the nursing telehealth guidelines. Well, they call it standards. So the difference between standards and guidelines, by the way, is that standards are required. It's your ethical code in an association. And whether you're a member of that association or not, if something goes wrong, for you to protect yourself, you need to adhere to those things because in a court of law, you will be held to that standard even if you don't pay the dues and belong to the association. So, And some state laws have actually adopted the ethics code of a discipline as part of the state law for that discipline. So you really need to understand these rules and how to operate by them. Now, um, ICU nursing has their own consensus statement about telehealth. So you may want to take a look at that if you're an ICU nurse. The American Psychiatric Association just came out with something in April of 2018. They collaborated with the American Telemedicine Association for telepsychiatry best practices. So my point here is a lot, all the disciplines have something. Social work, technology standards. This is the most thorough one that I've seen, and it was just published in the summer of 2017. And it looks at not only the individual practitioner, but also the agency. So what's my obligation if I'm an agency worker? What if, if I run an agency? What, what do I have to do above and beyond what the individual practitioner would have to do? So it's very well thought out. And I'm just going to give you an idea here of one of these areas, which is competence. So every single one of the, dis the disciplines that I've mentioned has a section that's a preamble to their code of ethics that talks about having integrity and not committing fraud and and being transparent and social justice and just general values, if you will. And then they get into specific standards. They all not only mention the values that they want the professional to have, but also competence. And how do you define competence? Now, no group had come up with that before, but it's important that you think about not only following the laws, and then having been competent in your regular treatment area, let's say it's working with depressed people or PTSD clients, patients, whatever your, your specialty is, your area of focus, but also competence in telebehavioral health. And this is one of the biggest issues that I'm excited about helping people get because we have a tremendous workforce that is just on the verge of being involved with telehealth. We have at any given point in time in Congress about 12, at least 12 bills on the floor to open the floodgates for funding, for licensure, to standardize practice across the disciplines, team-based approaches, accountable care organizations, Medicare, Me Medicaid. There are, there are bills that have bipartisan support, and this is just a matter of very short amount of time compared to the 24 years I put into this field, but things are right about to break loose. And most of the workforce not only isn't competent to telebehavioral health, they don't even understand that they need to be competent. So, you know, I'm preaching to the choir if you're here, but hopefully it helps spread the word. 
Provenance is a very big deal because all the ethical codes that I just looked at start there. You have to be competent in whatever you do. So let, let's just think about this for a moment. How does competence fit in the picture? States establish laws like privacy, okay? And the regulatory boards, the licensing boards come down and say, okay, the way you're going to maintain privacy as a physician or as a social worker, or whatever the, the, count, the uh, board is, you're going to follow these documentation guidelines, okay? These are, and dep depending on the state, you need to sign your, your SOAP note, you need to date it, you need to track if someone's homicidal or who's suicidal. Or There's a, a plethora of things that different states require as part of the documents for any specific discipline. So those are regulatory codes, okay? Now, ethical standards say, okay, you have to adhere to all of that, and we're going to talk about the discipline now. The discipline, of course, being social work, counseling, MFT, addictions, you know, all the things we listed earlier. Now, guidelines are a distillation of the literature that's more specific than standards, more specific than the ethical code. So the ethical code is general. The guideline would be record-keeping guidelines, okay? Record-keeping guidelines for telehealth could be a, another specialty topic, and you'll see sections about that in these guidelines that I mentioned earlier. Out of that should come competencies. Out of competencies should come training, and out of training should come professional service delivery. Unfortunately, many clinicians in our country sort of have all of this backwards. They just go do whatever, and then they think about the rest of this later. So now we've got a much bigger push in, in terms of the federal government, the Institute of Medicine since 2001, saying, all training needs to be competency-based. So a team of researchers and I came up with uh, an interprofessional team. There's six different disciplines involved, and we spent four years looking at competencies, and we came up with what we call the CTIBS Interprofessional Framework for Telebehavioral Health Competencies. We've identified seven domains, five subdomains, 51 objectives for telebehavioral health, and then 149 practices. And I'm going to just walk you through some of the practices because I just don't have the time to go through a whole lot of detail about everything. But these practices are designed for the novice, the student in essence, the trainee, the intern, the proficient, which is the licensed person or supervisor, and then the authority, somebody who does research in the field, someone who is a consultant, you know, that, that level. So we have across the domains. Now, what I want to encourage you to do is to not only see training, but see training to be a competent behavioral, telebehavioral professional. And think about it in, in one of these five steps. So here's a roadmap for you in terms of developing your own competence. One, understand the basic standards, guidelines, or competencies for your field. As I said, no other group has developed competencies, only CTIBS, which is a coalition for technology and behavioral science, by the way. You'll find them at ctibs.org. That's Coalition for Technology and Behavioral Science. And they come up with these, camp, these um, competencies. And that's a group I helped found years ago. So you can get that document. I'll also give you uh, a link to that as, uh, through, the, through this particular program. And then decide on the training you need. Look at the competencies that are needed for telebehavioral health. And then look at the, get some training that you decide you need or that your state decides you need, because some states now are requiring certain amounts of hours for training in telebehavioral health, and then come up with your own to-do list. Without a to-do list, your training is worthless, frankly. It's an exercise. But if you don't get a to-do list that you follow, then your exercise isn't going to lead to anything, right? So get yourself a to-do list. Get yourself a pad, electronic or a written pad, and write stuff down. It's, oh, you got to do this, got to do that. And look for a program that gives you checklists. You know, the, the developers of a training program should give you checklists to make this easy for you. When you buy training, it's sort of like buying a graduate education. They drag you through, this is my opinion, graduate education or medical education drags you through material that you otherwise would never do on your own because it's potentially not inherently, all of it is not that inherently interesting. So walk away with the checklist. And then make that checklist even more specific for every technology. Because you may choose to use a video, you may choose to use apps, you may choose to use email, texting. Each one of those has its own ins and outs. Telephone's another one. Many states include telephone in the definition of telehealth these days. 
So you want your checklist specific to the technology because they all have their own risks and benefits. And then add the to-dos for your own specific population. Now I'm going to take you a little bit deeper dive. I've given you the over, overall um, overview. We'll get into more specific things like legal issues. First is, on the list of many questions I get is practicing over state and national borders. The reality here is that you are licensed in one state. If at the time of passing your licensing exam you said, oh, yippee, thank you for that California license. I want to go practice in New York with that now or in Greece because I happen to be Greek in origin and I speak Greek and I can, I can get some people to pay me from, from Greece. Uh, they probably take the license back from me, right? So you can't practice over state lines. And a lot of clinicians think that licensure has to do with them. If you think back to what I was telling you earlier about the originating site, licensure really travels with the client so or the patient. So if your, your client or patient is working with you, let's say you're licensed in California like I am, and they go to Nebraska for a month, because mom had a heart attack and they want to take care of her, are you licensed in Nebraska? No, you're not. When you're practicing in Nebraska, you have to be licensed in Nebraska for most of these disciplines. And there it's on you to find out what you need to do for your discipline. Now, if you think, well, my person is, is a resident of California, so it doesn't matter where they, they are right now, that's been changed, okay? Now the states have become much more aware of these issues and like I said earlier, the vast majority of them, I think I know one state that doesn't require this in all the disciplines involved here. Um, you have to be licensed where the patient is at the time of contact. Now do you not take a call if someone calls you? Of course you do. We always have responded to emergencies, but we don't do our regular Tuesday afternoon at 3 o'clock appointment when we work with somebody who's over state lines at the time of contact. And there are many ins and outs to this kind of to these kinds of questions, but basically what I need you to understand is that the state laws are designed to protect the consumers of that state, much like traffic laws do when you go to New York State or you go to Florida or you go to California. Some states let you turn on a right, uh, make a right turn on a red light. Some states don't, you see. You have to follow the law of where you are. That's how this is with licensure. You have to follow the law of the state you enter into with technology, even with an app. So if your app collects information from people when they're in Iowa or Nebraska and they transmit it to you, technically you're practicing illegally over statements. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that reform is coming. Like I said earlier, there are a bunch of laws in Congress right now. There's a lot of people pushing on this but we're not there yet. So the only thing you can do is educate yourself about the requirements for each state and country that you choose to enter, and that means contacting the board of the discipline for that state. And if you say, well, they don't answer the phone, or they don't, they're not responding to me, they're not answering email, the best avenue is email, because then you have a paper record of, and a timestamp with a name, but if they don't respond to that, then send them an email and summarize what you think is going on, and at least you've established a paper trail. If you want to go into other countries, then what you can do is talk to the embassies of those countries and at least make an effort to find out what that local authority needs you to do. So if you want to go to Greece, I just spoke in Ohio a few months ago and there was a woman, a psychologist from Japan, who said that there was a, she had to go to Japan to pass the Japanese psychology licensing exam. So many countries do have licensing exams, even if you're not aware of it, as I said earlier, ignorance is not a defense in the face of the law. So you need to be mindful of that. And it's not that someone's going to come and drag you out of bed in the middle of the night and throw you in jail if you don't pay attention to these things. It's that if there's a complaint against you, all of this comes up and you can be held against you. And there again, licensure is not something to play with. Okay, This is your meal ticket. So this allows you to practice. So if you need to take a state's jurisprudence exam, then you take it. A lot of them are open book. It's not that prohibitive. And all they want you to do in most cases here, if they want you to get licensed in their state, is to show to them that you understand their state law because they may have laws that they think are really important over what we yours say. Okay, documentation requirements is also part of this licensure thing. People think, oh, I can just practice where I want. There's a lot more involved in licensure. There are many requirements. 
that go along with it. So documentation kind of helps you get clear about it. And the thing is, it can differ from one state to another. It can, state, it can differ from one technology to another. So the requirements for what you do with the telephone can be different than what you have to do in email versus what you have to do in um, video. Okay, so informed consent, you have to have an intake and assessment, your progress, an intake assessment note, right? So an assessment process, including psychological testing or um, mental status exam, all these things have been shown as being effective through technology, but you have to understand the protocols and the models, as I mentioned earlier, do your lit review, or buy some training that'll help you get through that easily. You have to have progress notes that are unique to various states as well. Many states have specific requirements. The termination note is something you may want to take into account as well when you're doing telehealth. What about your mandated reporting? Some states are tariff soft states, duty to warn states, others are not. You have to know that. Don't want to be reporting somebody if they don't require you to do that because then they could sue you for breach of confidentiality. So you see there's ins and outs that really means you have to understand what's going on in the state. Then there also are organizational um, administrative requirements, so URAC, a JCO, Joint Commission, a CARF. There are many groups that have their own requirements on top of all of this for your being in their group. Now I'm going to drill down to one of those documents with informed consent. We actually have a lot of material about informed consent. So there's this is a very complex area, but I'm going to just hit it really quick. So informed consent document only serves as evidence that a process took place. The process is a meeting of the minds. You have to be reasonably assured that the person you're working with understands what you're going to do and accepts that. So you just have them sign a document, done, that it's not adequate, and in court that could really hurt you. Uh, it, these requirements from informed consent also differ from state to state. So also, whatever it is you decide to work with in terms of an informed consent document, you want a local attorney to review it because, like I said, the laws change from state to state. And there's also this idea of active versus static informed consent. So active meaning an ongoing. Let's say you start with video and you decide you want to use an app. Well, when three, four sessions down the line or 10 or whatever, then you can document that you talk about the app and how to put it on the person's phone and what it's supposed to do and privacy protections and all the stuff that goes around introducing an app. But that's active informed consent. It's a dynamic process. It's not a one time you sign this document, we're going to go, we're never going to talk about any other safety measures with informed consent. So to help you get going with this, we have a library of 50 clauses that we, in our trainings, encourage people to look at, to consider with their population. So I'm happy to make that available to you for free. You can just write to contact at telehealth.org and then take your base telebehavioral health informed consent document and look at it in terms of well, which of these clauses would be helpful. Maybe you'll find three, maybe you'll find 10. It's up to you, depending on A, your setting, and B, your population. Those two critical factors that I mentioned earlier. Let's talk about HIPAA a little bit. If you recall, 1996, HIPAA talked about three laws, transmission, privacy, security. A lot of people don't understand the privacy law. There are 18 types of privacy issues that you need to be aware of as a clinician. There again, we can't get into a whole lot of it, but you have to, as one of these factors, choose HIPAA-compliant technology. So you're a covered entity. If you're a practitioner, you're a covered entity. And uh, using electronics, then you're a covered entity then you have to use HIPAA compliant technology. And the term HIPAA compliant is a misnomer. The technical way to talk about this is that it's HIPAA compatible because HIPAA does not sit around and, and check off this, this company is good, this one's good. What it does is it issues a set of standards. And so companies then can claim that they're compatible with these standards. Okay? But now the nomenclature has evolved so that HIPAA compliance is the term. If a company is HIPAA compatible or HIPAA compliant, whatever term they need to use, then they will tell you that. This is not a mystery. They probably paid a lot of money to reach those, those, that level of standards. So they will advertise that. And then, of course, you want to get a business associate agreement that says that, that's a BAA, that says that they will defend you in a court of law if they are not really compliant. So you definitely want a BAA when you work with 
with a technology company. And the word there is don't work with your brother-in-law's company, get a company that, that is a substantial one. Okay? Now, if you want to know more about this, we've created a directory at telehealth.org, and there again, that's free to you to go look up different technologies. It's sort of a buyer's guide, and it helps you identify some companies that at the time we cataloged them were claiming HIPAA compliance or HIPAA compatibility. There again, buyer beware, you have to check out your own, your own thing and make sure that they've got a BAA to help you out. Now, another issue about computer repair is security. Not a good idea to leave your equipment at a repair shop overnight or even during the day if you have a bunch of, of patient information on there. You can have your repairs conducted in your office where you can at least monitor, you get to eyeball what was going on and then use dedicated equipment. Some people just get a phone for your practice so you're not giving out information about your clients as they kind of come up and light up your screen uh, to your child or your teenager because they need to make a quick call. So get your own laptop, get your own computer and keep that secure, keep that away from everybody else in your family and your friends. So in summary here for HIPAA, there are requirements. Look these terms up, risk assessment, business associate agreement, and office policies, okay? Office policies, I'll just give you a little bit more on. Do you have to have a written, written evidence of having developed some policies and educated your team about those policies? And they have to be about repair, staff training, breach notification, what will you do if there is a breach of what's going on? You also need to, to engage in a fair amount of client patient training. I'm taking a slide or two, you probably notice you're out of topics that may have 10 or 20 or 30 slides in my entire training deck for two-day training. So just to give you a little smattering, computer repair considerations also make sure that their computer, they understand whatever they put in their computer, you can't protect them from that because they, they are, might be sharing that computer with other people. And you have to tell them who's going to see whatever records you keep and you know, you're working with a supervisor or you have a tech team that has access to this, you're working for an online company, who can see what you write in those notes, what's their clearance, so you need to check a lot of this stuff. What about recording? The number one issue that clients have is they're concerned about the privacy of what they tell you and that being recorded and going out and showing up on YouTube or someplace. Now, as far as client patient assessment and screening, they are setting specific, okay? So the key factor is the location of the client and the patient. So when you think about screening and assessment, a professional setting is that classic model, right? So the person would go to a doctor's office or a psychologist's office, and they would be able to be in a controlled environment. So pretty much any diagnosis can be treated there, and actually the initial work in telepsychiatry was with psychotic patients, bipolar patients on locked units. When the local people didn't know what to do, meant they might have been in a prison cell, they didn't know what to do, so they went and got a consultation. So yes, telebehavioral health can be conducted with people with all kinds of diagnoses, but the setting is control. So the more severe the diagnosis, the more control in the setting. When we're going to the home, it's better to keep to the less severe diagnoses and exclude the, the, the more difficult diagnoses to manage, depression, severe anxiety, depression, anger, uh, those kinds of things not that great an idea to start developing online training, or I'm sorry, online um, interventions for people like that without a whole lot of control in your platform and a lot of clinicians involved in different disciplines to help you think that through. Now, public settings, not a good idea to do psychotherapy in a public setting, uh, not a good idea to do psychotherapy on a, when someone's seated on a park bench talking to you on their phone either, or in the backseat of a cab or underneath a bridge uh, with, with a group of people around them. So unless you've got some special arrangement, not that great. Boundaries. Be aware of potential boundary violations with using emoticons or abbreviations. We're not here to be friendly with people. We are professionals. Maintain your professional stance, okay? Don't reveal too much about your home, yourself. Make sure that things are not visible on your camera. You don't want old exercise equipment with your gym clothes hanging off in the background, things like that. Make sure your camera's properly positioned away from an opening door so if a family member comes running through the door, they're not going to be on camera. Be aware of when you share your screen, you might, oops, show them things that you really didn't mean to show anybody. So be very careful with screen sharing and how you portray yourself in social media. Licensing boards are reacting to lots of social media complaints, so be very careful about that. Telepresence. You can slow down, as I just did right now, when you're trying to make a point, when you want to show empathy. You can lean forward like this and look directly into the camera, you see. 
that shows interest, it shows concern, as opposed to leaning back, putting your feet up on the desk, swiveling in your chair, you know, just tapping your desk. There are lots of things that people do that are extremely annoying to the person on the other end because of what the camera and the microphone do to us. So be wary, aware of your telepresence. Handling emergencies. Know your community resources. Do not shotgun your services out on the internet. You're responsible to know community resources according to a lot of the guidelines that I showed you earlier. Have your proper informed consent that gives you emergency contact numbers, the family and friends of people that you're working with, and an agreement as to what you will tell those people and when, okay? Regarding uh, agreements regarding children and other vulnerable parties, a sitter for children, so they're not banging on the door. Uh, and then come up with a written and agreed upon safety plan. The safety plan can be a a, a kind of a, progress, a work in progress where you work collaboratively with clients and patients to come up with safety. Make sure that your firearms are secured. If someone has a firearm in the home, drugs and alcohol are managed. Continue with risk and behavior assessments and documentation every session. Is this still appropriate? Is it not appropriate? And then this plan of who you're going to contact and when. And I'm going to give you quickly some resources and turn it back over to Dr. Mogul to take your questions. So the resources that there are many of them on the internet. I'm just going to give you some of the high points. There is a group of federally funded resource agencies called Telehealth Resource Centers. They're geographically located. This one in particular, the Center for Connected Health Policy, focuses on policy, and they have a report that is available to you for free on their website, and it's called the State Telehealth Laws and Reimbursement Policies. Once again, the Center for Connected Health Policy. Now, those are your tax dollars at work. They can help you understand not only current law, but all the pending law in your state. Very useful if you're trying to develop a program. Also, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has a brochure that they give out called Telehealth Services. This is updated every year. This is 2018 version, and it will tell you about Medicare reimbursement. Medicare is a precursor to a lot of other insurance plans, so it's always useful to take a look at this. It identifies who gets reimbursed, where they have to be, where the patient has to be, and a lot of other details about billing, and the, including CPT codes. The U.S. Department of Defense Mobile Health Practice Guide, this is a this is a wonderful document that I just discovered recently, it was just published in 2017, that helps you think through how to use an app, not only with your population, but in an agency setting and with your coworkers. Another resource that I want to tell you about is the resources we have at our institute, the Telebehavioral Health Institute, which is at telehealth.org. We have a blog with over 400 blog posts related to telebehavioral health, and we have a free weekly newsletter that goes out through email to help you keep current. We we gather the news in telebehavioral health every week, and then we uh, send it out to you in this email format. So with that, I'm happy to take some questions with one caveat, and that is that I and SAMHSA cannot endorse any specific service for telehealth. So please don't ask me questions about what do I think about this platform or that platform because we can't really get into those that level of advocating for one and not the other. So with that, Dr. Mogul, let's turn the microphone back over to you. Thanks, Dr. Mayhew. As you can imagine, you've stimulated much, much interest across the country. So let's try to get through our questions in the order they were received. Um, how do DEA guidelines, including Dillon's Law, impact prescribing medications with telehealth? The DEA has been at the forefront of discussions with the American Telemedicine Association, and, and I've been a very active uh, member of the American Telemedicine Association, so they've actually come out and participated on panels, and a lot of this focuses on the Ryan Hate Act, and that the Ryan Hate Act required that prescribers, okay, um, have an in-person session and before they, they prescribe. So for telehealth, through, through telehealth platforms of any type. And um, the DEA has been working with this because there are lots of complaints about that. And uh, as technology improves, our ability to diagnose and treat is getting better and better. Our assessment tools is, are getting better and better. So the DEA is at the forefront. That is something that to stay current with is a, a task, and I want to encourage you to, to go and research that. and talk with them directly. They are very, very open. I've had a number of conversations with the director there, and so uh, it's, it's a very big area. If you look at some states, New Jersey, for example, just passed a telemedicine law for the entire state that impacts counselors, psychologists, as well as all the, the, the medical, all the healthcare groups, and they do require an in-person assessment, 
for telehealth. But these things are also getting revised. So they'll put a stake in the ground on one issue, but then it's getting challenged and getting overturned. So like I said, lots of changes right now in, in the works. Thanks. As you use the term telebehavioral health, does it include psychopharmacology? Absolutely. Psychopharmacology is part of behavioral health care. So anything that has to do with technology, then we're including in the telebehavioral health. Anything over distance that actually transmits that is the tele part. Tele is a Greek word for across distance. Okay, so absolutely. Uh, psychopharmacology could be referring to, I'm not too sure about the questioner there, but uh, to prescription privileges. So medical psychologists. I've been very active working with them and uh, just did a panel, the American Psychological Association, uh, last, last week about prescription privileges and working, working within a state as well as over state lines which you certainly can work over state lines. Let me just clear up that in terms of the, the prescribers out there that are doing this type of psychopharmacology work. You can practice over state lines. You have to be licensed or registered in the foreign state, which may sound easy, but it is a rigmarole in terms of paperwork and fees. But certainly uh, one of the gals on the panel that we had last week was licensed, I think, in five states and another one in, in two states. So it's, it's, it's happening more and more. Thank you. I believe you touched upon this a little earlier. If the originating site is in the patient's home, how can those safety and IT concerns be ensured? How can the provider ensure service is private uh, and HIPAA compliant? This is a really good question. The thing is, you need to know what you're doing. <laughs> okay. So I can't just get this is part of very detailed training. And there are many, many things that you can do. There are agreements that you have to have. There could be code words that you give to the person to let you know something's up on their end. They want you to discontinue. So there are lots of ways to do that. To ask people to uh, do a room check with a camera. Um, there, so that's a very, very long uh, answer. I mean, it could be a very long answer, but that's why people would need to get training because it's very difficult to control that. And the truth is, as I mentioned earlier, if someone has a more severe diagnosis, you can't control that. You cannot control someone's psychosis in their living room. I don't care how good you are. This is not a matter of your, your, your skills. It's a matter of physical capability. You just can't do it. And so your job is to make sure that you're properly screening people. I just did a presentation up in uh, Vancouver for forensic psychologists that work for the province of um, British Columbia. And their job is to do assessments over video. Very complex issue. Because these are these can be life-altering decisions that they're making. Is this person going to be incarcerated for the next 20 years or not? You see, so this, but that is these are much fuller discussion. Indeed, thank you. If I reside in one state, but the patient is in another state, and I am licensed in that other state, but not in the one I reside in, can I work with them through telehealth? I love these questions, yes. Um, in most states, the answer is that you can work with their citizens if you're licensed with that board. Once again, licensure follows the patient. The need for licensure follows the patient or the client, okay? But there are some states that say, no, you can't do that, okay? Alaska, in some disciplines, does not want you to be out of state and working with Alaskans. And there are many reasons for this, but one is that they don't want people from other states overrunning the jobs that are available to the local people, okay? But then you say, well, gee, the person has to travel a thousand miles to get to me. So this is all getting hammered out. Another state where you look at a different set of parameters is Florida. Florida literally doubles in size in, in the winter, okay, in terms of the population. So we have the Florida boards now saying, if you come into our state, then you need to be licensed with us because we want you to understand our rules because there's a lot of way too much is happening for that. And so you really, the best thing I can say, no matter what your question is about interjurisdictional practice is A, look up that term interjurisdictional practice, or get our newsletter and wait for us to send you news about that because we, we include that regularly. And then contact the board of every um, discipline for every state you want to go, no, I'm sorry, 
I'll say that in a different way. Contact the boards for, for your discipline in every state you want to enter. And if you think, well, I'm not going to wait six months to get an answer, be able to demonstrate that you tried, okay, and get some consultation in that case. If you can't get through to that, to that board, then get consultation and speak to a lawyer about that as well. At least document Thanks. that you tried. 42 CFR Part 2, is that more strict than HIPAA? Actually, it can. So for those of you that are unaware of that, 42 CFR Part 2 has to do with substance use, so addictions treatment. It, in many ways, parallels it, okay? But there are issues related there that you need to be aware of. So yes, if you're working in that world, that is one of those administrative issues that I mentioned earlier, or a state-specific issue. So you need to take the time to read that, and if you don't understand it, get some training so that you really do understand it. Can medication-assisted treatment, MAT, be offered via telehealth, for example, the prescribing of Suboxone? Absolutely. If you think about the classic telehealth model, there is an in-person assessment by a local person, okay, and a consultant is brought in to advise. Now, the treatment can be transferred over to the consultant or it can continue with that consultative model, but the local practitioner does the prescribing. So this can be done over state lines. If the consultant in some states needs to be licensed in that state or might just happen to be in that same state. So it doesn't matter what the issue is. I don't care if you're working with substance use, if you're working with ADHD, PTSD, regardless of the issue, telehealth is available and is appropriate. The thing is you as a clinician need to understand the ins and outs of the treatment that you're offering. When you're working with a, 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 an, an addicted patient, an opioid addicted patient, for example, like in this case, where in the treatment process are they? Are they getting assessed? Are they still in those initial months of admitting that they have an issue? Or is this aftercare? Aftercare is a lot safer because this person has literally been in very intensive treatment and there is a clinical staff involved. That clinical staff can be involved in the aftercare, whereas up until telehealth, they couldn't be. If that person came from out of state, they had to release the person to go back to their state of origin and they couldn't do follow-up because of the state laws. But now somebody can be licensed in a, in a facility and they can do aftercare if they're licensed and they can get licensed in these foreign states as well. So yes, any type of treatment can be done. I know that the opioid issue is a very big one right now, but a medically assisted treatment is a very hot topic and we at the Institute are very focused on that one as well. Absolutely. So, yeah. I think we'll have time for one more question. So what if a telehealth visit is not completed for technical or other reasons, and a diagnosis or a treatment couldn't be delivered at the end. Are there any protocols? Can the patient still be billed? Is the provider under any obligation to arrange for a face-to-face -face visit? These are good questions, and, I, and I'm going to refer you back to the in-person session. Let's say you have a session with somebody in your office and something happens like this, and the, the session, you, um, there's a fire drill, and, or there's a fire in the building, and you have to leave the building. Is it legitimate for you to bill for that session? Okay. So the reference point is always in-person care. So no matter what your question is, what's a corollary in-person? Would it be legitimate for you to bill for the entire whatever it is, you know, um, session? All the minutes of that, because, you know, these sessions, CPT codes, have minutes associated with them. Did you deliver that care? Yes, no. All right? Then you have to make that decision about what you're going to do. And I want to encourage you to have these discussions with your colleagues. This is not just something that there, there's a rule book about, okay? But many of these things are little nuances that if you have a full discussion with a training group or with a, a collegial group, a professional association group, Form some groups where you can get some feedback about this kind of thing because, you know, most of us would like to bill, but eh, I only delivered 23 minutes. I didn't deliver the full session. What do you do?
tough, tough okay, question. Thank you very much. Well, speaking of full sessions, I'm, <laughs> I fear we've reached uh, our, uh, our limit here. We could probably do this all afternoon. Thank you to all the callers uh, and participants who wrote in questions. I fear that we could not get to all of them. However, I would encourage all callers to visit the website at www.telehealth.org. Um, there are a number of resources there. One may also register for online courses, and uh, we encourage you to, to, to do avail yourself of those resources there. So with that, Dr. Mayhew, a profound thanks for your very stimulating and informative discussion today on telebehavioral health from the clinician's perspective. I'd like to thank everyone for, for, for calling in this afternoon. I'd like to wish you all, on behalf of the BHITS team and on behalf of SAMHSA, a very good afternoon. Take care.